Good morning. So while collecting your answers, a couple of things. Thank you for the feedback. Uh, in no particular order, just several things. I think labs tedious and uh, repetitive. Well, thank you. That's by design. You've noticed. <clears throat> That's what learning is about. If you think learning is fun, uh, probably you were born on the wrong planet. Learning, work, life, tedious and repetitive. But uh, more students say teaching fellows good help. Uh, again, contradictory statements about exam problems. Not a lot like like homework. Similar to homework. It only proves the fact that different people, when look at the same things, have different view. They perceive, we perceive things differently depending on our previous experience, our background. It's not an action, it's an interaction between us and the world around. And uh, again, uh, unlike homework, homework problems, well, I've never said exam problems will be similar to homework problems or like homework problems. I said homework, labs, class, someone said we didn't solve at home a problem with electric current. Yes, we did it in a class. Electric current equals EMF over resistance. Uh, <clears throat> someone made a complaint that well, maybe not a complaint, just the fact that the exam didn't cover all topics we've learned. Well, I have two weeks to think about it. <clears throat> I cannot reduce the number of topics. That's on a syllabus, a standard syllabus for this typical course all across the, all universities. So I only can increase the number of problems. So you think practically. And uh, someone wrote this exam was too easy. Well, maybe for some people, which is again based on the feeling and perspective. However, uh, the matter of fact is this time no student got a 40, well, 100%. So. Again, it's just an illustration of a difference between the feelings and facts. Facts, they exist. Well, uh, there is some shift in the distribution, actually, after the first exam, the maximum fell on the second answer. Now, so far, the maximum is on the third. So again, it's not related to any specific I don't know, law. It just, again, describes the change in our perspective in our feeling about things. And uh, <clears throat> this is just an example. Again, the distribution is wide. And uh, the average is about 32, but we still have two thirds in the range of A and B, which is good. Well, some faculty may say that is wrong. Again, it's a matter of perspective where people would like to have the maximum. Yeah. 
of the distribution. <clears throat> Again, I have to remind you that WebAssign knows everything. I don't particularly look for odd things, but when I have to transfer grades from a WebAssign to a Blackboard and my eye caught something odd, I have to investigate. And if I start investigating and I see something wrong, I have to inform that's wrong. <coughs> that's uh, uh, <coughs> things which could have been and might be <coughs> considered as attempt for cheating. No one can answer eight questions in less than a minute. Well, physics. <coughs> So we're starting our last third. We're going to talk about optics this week. And next week, we're going to talk about quantum world a little bit. And optics is the study of properties of light, which is the most important uh, matter for us, for people, because the most of the information for us comes from light through our eyes. And uh, <coughs> This is what we're going to learn this week, four days. And we start from just looking at experiments first. And then we'll, well, that's how physics works in general. We start noticing things because we have eyes, and then we start thinking about it. So. Uh, while I'm going to do my experiments, you should think about the answer to this question. And uh, this is not a question about your particular knowledge. This is a question about what you think, what you feel, you know, what, based on your previous years of life experience, what you have heard. One of the experiments which people have been done for thousands of years is making a shadow. So there is no light behind me because it cannot penetrate. I'm not transparent. So how would we explain this? Well, one of the experiments explanations is that light actually made of tiny particles traveling from a source. This is just a representation of a, an object which shoots particles, yeah? and when it hits the obstacle, something opaque, it sticks to it. We call it absorption. But that's only one possible idea, right? So there are many. By now, you should choose your answer. Don't be scared. It will come back soon. <clears throat> so, this last glimpse. The answers. So, light. Well, we need a source. And uh, if we study property of light, and we think it propagates in terms of trajectory. Now we have a very nice source for that, a laser pointer. And uh, we cannot see the whole beam. We only can see the spot where the light hits the wall. But let's hope it's not toxic. Now we can see the beam, and uh, 
you will be doing a lab with lasers eventually. So the rule number one, do not look into the laser. Do not aim laser into your or anybody else's eye. So what we see here is the light which travels away from air, well, fog particles. They scatter the light uh, emitted by the laser pointer, and th that light travels away and reaches your eye. But if you would look, you see how bright it is. Oop. You see how bright it is. So it's actually uh, brighter than looking straight at the sun. So be careful. Now, <laughs> with a powerful source, what can we do? Well, the first phenomenon people learn about, well, actually second, the first was absorption. Yeah, light is getting absorbed. But if it's not absorbed, what's happening to it? It's getting reflected. So right here, no, what would? Right here, I have a mirror. Do you see it? Do you see it? That's what I thought. That's why we have to use our imagination or a flashlight. The choice is mine. And this time, I choose the flashlight. See? Mirror. Tiny, relatively flat mirror. We cannot see ourselves in this mirror. A shiny surface. Reflects light. Yeah, but the flashlight is not very good for observing the properties of a mirror. Here, we can see how the light ray bounces of the mirror, and uh, we can measure angles and make conclusions. The most important part is that when we have a mirror and we shine several several rays parallel to each other. After reflection, they remain parallel. This is not always the case. For example, there's a different type of a mirror. This is a curved mirror. And, uh, well, the shiny surface of this mirror is outside. And what we see is that after the reflection, the rays, which initially parallel to each other, now diverge. They travel away from each other. That's not always the case. If we switch the surface and now the inner surface becomes shiny, again, the flashlight not really helpful, but if we look at what's happening to parallel rays, when they are reflected, they travel through the same point. They, after reflection, get, we say, bent toward the middle line. So two different curved mirrors toward away from the middle line. Of course, we have to figure out how to describe this mathematically. Now, um, <clears throat> a standard experiment. Water, air, well, again, flashlight doesn't really help to see what is happening. 
when light travels from air into water or from water into air. So we can use a laser pointer. And uh, well, this is a classical experiment. We have two protractors. One protractor is above the surface, second is below the surface. So we can measure any angles we want to. And uh, for example, right now, one beam approaching the middle point, the interface between air and water at 55 degrees, and then it travels in water, and we can see it bends. So that's what we call refraction when we have to study this property. And uh, <clears throat> for refraction, there is a very interesting phenomenon when light actually cannot travel out from the medium. It remains in the medium. And uh, for that, we need to shine the light well, from water into air. So well, this is actually not water. This is the tonic water, tonic. Simple, regular tonic you can buy anywhere. But what's good about it, if you buy also a blue laser pointer, which nowadays is relatively cheap. You can see how light travels through it. Just a regular tonic water. So if I have it here, I can again see how light bends. And again, let's hope it's not toxic. Well, what I see Okay, yeah, I have to come. I need more of this. Oh, much, much, much better. So we can see the beam and then it travels and bends. But what is happening if the same beam travels out? Where is it? Where is it? Here. It actually, right here, get reflected back into this medium, well, in the tonic. It doesn't get out. So <clears throat> this phenomenon depends on the angle. If I change the angle, I actually can see some of the light out. That's standard refraction. But at a certain angle, the light now gets completely reflected back. What is the angle? How can we calculate it? We will have to figure it out. This phenomenon has a name, a total internal reflection. Totally reflects back. And this phenomenon is being used for creating fiber optical uh, guides. This is just, of course, a model. But light is being guided doesn't get out in the air, and we just have to make it thin, round, long, cheap, and we can use it. That's how fires, fires works. It guides light with different frequencies inside. Well, uh, okay. One more and the last maybe for today. So refraction. Uh, refraction happens, of course, in any medium right here. Oh, we don't need this anymore. I have a large prism here. So what's going to happen if I shine the light through it? Well, it depends. For example, right now, 
Actually, green is better. Uh, human eye is the most sensitive to the green color. So right now you can see the beam of light enters here, but here it reflects no light beyond the surface. That's a total internal reflection. Uh, <coughs> this is a similar situation, goes reflected, reflected. So a prism can actually be used like a mirror, and it's being used in many devices like a mirror, in periscope, telescope. But of course, uh, at a certain angle, we can see a regular refraction, light travels through, light bends, and we can use this to manufacture very special, very important optical devices. We call them a lens. A lens is a piece of glass or plastic which is thicker in the middle or thinner in the middle, and uh, so there are different, different types of lenses. What's going to happen with the beam? It bends. It bends. But of course, it's easier to see what's happening if you just use several rays which are, which are parallel to each other. Again, see? When these rays travel through this lens, there's a specific location where they all cross, intersect. And, uh, well, we need to figure out how to use this fact for different practical applications. What's going to happen if I flip the lens? So flat surface, and this is a convex surface. Well, still the same effect. So it's not the orientation of the lens. What matters, it's where it's thicker and thinner. This lens is thicker in the middle than on the edges. However, there is another one. This one is thin in the middle and thick on the edges. And how does it affect the rays? Well, now, when they travel through the lens, we can see they actually diverge. They bend away from the middle line. And, uh, well, we will have to figure out how to explain all these experiments and how to describe them mathematically, how to use them for our everyday life. And for that, first, we have to turn on the light. Second, we have to roll down the screen. Third, we have to answer this question. And the answer is, Maybe, but technically it depends. And it actually even uh, different school, schools, different schools in physics answer this question differently. Two most popular answers are both or neither. So light is basically a type of matter which sometimes behaves like a set of particles traveling away from a source and hitting everything. But sometimes it acts like a wave. So I would say it's neither, it's something different, which has properties of both. And of course, historically and initially, people thought of light as a, of a set of particles. And uh, Sir Isaac Newton was proponent and uh, uh, for a long period of time in physics, it, that was the dominant view that light is tiny, tiny particles which travel in space. And uh, eventually, after reflection, they reach our eyes, and that's why we see. They excite some nerves. And the question is,
So, what would you say? So, see, I always look at several people simultaneously. Who moves first? That's you. Light of a blue color is reflected, of course, because that's how we have to register it. However, there's a difference between what we see and uh, the properties of light sometimes because a color is a result of a perception. And some people don't percept colors, but still it doesn't mean light doesn't have certain property which we assign to color. And by the way, from my long experience living in Boston, many people do not see difference between red, yellow, and green. It's just a fact. So the law of reflection, <clears throat> we saw that a straight beam being reflected of a mirror or any surface, and we can use a protractor to measure angles and uh, make a statement that two angles are always the same. Well, we have to give a name to everything important. And first of all, when we measure things, like angles, we have to state from what. And because a surface, a mirror, has area, something wide, to measure angles, we use not the surface itself. We use a line which is perpendicular to that surface. We call it a normal, because that's normal in physics to call normal, normal. And uh, <coughs> the angles which have names measured from that normal. So the uh, light ray approaching surface or mirror has a name, the incident ray. The angle from the incident ray to the normal has the angle of name, angle of incidence. Ray which is traveling away from a mirror, we call reflected. That's the angle of reflection. And the law says, the second part of the law, which everybody remembers, the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of uh, reflection or vice versa. But the first part is equally important. People forget about it. But if we forget about it, a reflection like that would be allowed, but that's not not, that is not the case. We have a normal, we have a line. In geometry, two straight lines always form a plane. So the first part of the law says all three elements, all three geometrical lines, the incident ray, the normal to the surface, and the reflected ray should belong to the same plane. Well, <coughs> In, real, in uh, real life, when parallel rays are reflected by this table, they are reflected in all directions. Each individual ray, of course, satisfies to the law of reflection. However, because any r real surface is not absolutely smooth, yeah, so they get reflected in all possible directions. But if we polish the surface, in that case, we get a mirror and uh, uh, reflection when rays initially parallel, remain parallel after the reflection. That type of reflection has a name, spec specular reflection, bless you. And that's what a mirror does, a flat mirror, because we also saw different examples of a mirror. And, uh, well, we use a mirror every day in the morning when we look in the mirror. Uh, the first thought comes to mind. If you look in the mirror, you don't like what you see, don't blame the mirror. <coughs> <coughs> Properties of the mirror can be derived from the law of reflection. So please tell me what you think about this situation. You are looking in the mirror at yourself, large, flat mirror. 
you are four meters away from that mirror. So <clears throat> what is the distance from you to your image? Of course, to answer this question, because it's physics, we would have to start from a picture, drawing a picture. So uh, you can <coughs> draw a picture. And this picture should represent the most important objects involved in this phenomenon, which is a mirror and you. Instead of you, it could have been a candle, light bulb, any object. And uh, a mirror forms an image. That's what we see. If you drive, by the way, you know that every uh, mirror has a sentence. Yeah. Objects in the mirrors look smarter than they are, something like that. And uh, a flat mirror, of course, represented just by a straight line. And we need to draw an object. Well, we just have to represent the presence of something. That's it. Of course, it could have been an actual source of light, like a light bulb, or just a regular object like we are. Yeah, we don't shine light, no? But we reflect it. So light travels from other sources, get reflected of us, and travels toward the mirror. Some light rays travel away. So this light ray doesn't matter because it doesn't reach the mirror. But some light rays travel <coughs> toward the mirror and get reflected. How? According to the law of reflection. So this ray, it travels perpendicularly to the mirror. So how do we apply the law of reflection? Well, first we have to draw that line we call the normal. Where? Well, this normal doesn't do anything good for that ray. Yeah? So it is a normal, but we have to measure an angle between the ray and the normal. So the normal has to be drawn from the location where ray approaches, hits, touches the mirror. Now we have to look at the angle between the incident ray and the normal. For this particular ray, what number should I write for the angle of incidence? Thank you. Exactly. There is no angle between the normal and this ray. Which means the angle of reflection will be equal to zero automatically according to the law. So, which means this ray, when it gets reflected, should travel right back. That happens to all rays which approach the mirror perpendicularly to the mirror. Yeah. That's the angle between the ray and the mirror. Well, a second ray travels from <coughs> this same point at a certain angle. What do we do next? We draw the normal where? Well, at that point where the ray touches the mirror, what is the normal? It's a perpendicular to the mirror. Do we see the angle of incidence? Yes, we see it. This is the angle of incidence measured from the ray to the normal. Now, what does the law say? The angle of reflection should be equal to this. So we take a protractor, measure same angle, and draw a line, which, well, the arrowhead represents the direction of the motion of this light beam. And, uh, well, um, we can uh, we can uh, repeat this is this process for all parts of the object for all possible rays, but already we can see what's going to happen. First of all, as we know very well, there is always light at the end of a tunnel, but there is no light behind the mirror. No light 
here. So what do we do? We have to use the standard approach in optics when there is no light, when actual light rays do not intersect, do not converge, use extensions. So we use our imagination now. We pretend what would happen if that mirror had a tiny holes here and there, and the light actually could travel through. And here, some demon would actually make it travel like this. So these two rays, fictional rays, but geometrical fixtures, would, co would converge. So in this point, point P gives us an image of the original point O. And all other rays which leave the same point on an object, like this one, well, if it hits the mirror, just need to extend, extend the mirror, all other rays will be reflected in such a way so their extension will always go through, through the same point which represents the image of the original point. And uh, we can repeat the same process for all other points of an object. And that will give us more points on an image. Now what we can do? Well, now we can take a look at the distance from an object to the mirror. Now we can take a look at the distance from the image to the mirror. If this is four meters, simple geometry tells, for example, triangle O, A, B, and the triangle P, A, B are equal, identical. They have same angles, same sides. So, and uh, that means the distance, the distance from point O to point A, which has a standard name and standard symbol, the image distance, a distance from an uh, object distance, sorry, a distance from an object to a mirror, and a distance from point P to A, which we call the image distance, in this situation are equal to each other. That is a combination of physics, the law of reflection, and geometry. So four meters from a mirror, from you, it would be equal to, sure what it says. That is a question number five. Four and eight. So four means a distance from an image to a mirror, but a distance from you to an image will be four plus four, eight. So sometimes it's just a matter of reading carefully what we need to answer for, yeah? because distance well, can be measured between any two points, any two objects. Now, <clears throat> if we draw a very accurate diagram of you and the mirror, we can, we can actually see that depending on the size, depending on the size, if the mirror is too small, we just cannot see ourselves completely. You know, If it's large, of course we can. You know, if we look at the window, large window, we see ours, we see more. But if we have a very small mirror, we, we can only see a small portion of us. So there is a, a minimum size a mirror needs to have in order to fit our complete, our complete image. 
And this picture tells it should be equal to a half of us. So light from feet gets reflected, traveled into our eye, so we have to see it. And light from the top of our head gets reflected, travels to our eye. And these rays tell us that our image, image on another side should well be, well, first of all, it is equally large, has the same size, has the same orientation, is located at the same distance from the mirror, but we don't have to use the whole large uh, reflective surface. Yeah. We can cut it down here and up there, and that will be sufficient. But only if the top level of the mirror is a halfway, halfway between the top of a head and eyes. This is the line. Again, that's geometry, pure geometry, but kind of neat. So <clears throat> if you ever want to buy a mirror which would fit your image, you know it should be at least half of your size, half of your height. Well, <coughs> every image has certain properties which we need to know how to name. And those properties are size, orientation, and existence. This image exists for now, is only in our imagination. Why? Because there is no light behind a mirror. What do we use here to see an image of the slide? We use a screen. But if we would use a screen and place it behind the mirror and look at the screen, we wouldn't see anything. Because the mirror actually makes a shadow on that screen. So in order to see that image, we have to use an additional optical device, not just the screen. That additional optical device is what? An eye. An eye is a lens, and we saw lens, lenses actually can affect the rays. And <clears throat> in order to see that image, we have to place our eye on the right side of the, history, uh, of the mirror. <clears throat> if we place our eye here, we, we, we will not see anything. There is no light behind the mirror. How many times should I say that, right? So we have to look at the rays which are reflected. So we have to be here. We have to place our eye here. So reflected rays would get into our eye and then would converge on the retina. Without that additional device lens, we wouldn't be able to even talk about that type of an image. So in terms of the size, same, which means the same as the object. So how can we measure the size? Well, we can use a ruler. And in this situation, we say the size of an image, height of it, is equal to the size of the object. Now, orientation, same. And in this situation, we call it upright. And that is the normal case. We place an object upright and an image might be upright or inverted. This is upright. Existence doesn't exist. So we call it virtual image, our outdated word imaginary, because we have to imagine it, virtual. Well, so these are the properties of any flat mirror. The image is virtual, doesn't exist unless we use an extra optical device. Has the same size and uh, located at the same distance from the mirror. But <coughs> there is another standard agreement. When an image is upright, that variable which describes its size, h, height, 
should be positive. When an image is inverted, it should be negative. And, uh, well, in this situation, it's positive. Now, there is a physical variable which has a name magnification. By its definition, this is just the ratio of the size of an image over the size of an object. For the flat mirror, it is one. That's it. And if we measure a distance from an object to a mirror, the object distance, of course, an object is a real thing. We can touch it. It's always positive. But to describe that the image is virtual or real, the image distance can be positive or negative. If the image is virtual, we assign a negative number to the image distance. And that will, these agreements stay, remain for all optical devices. We just used flat mirror as an example, but we saw many more optical devices. For all those optical devices, all agreements remain the same. Well, <coughs> next mirror, it looks like this. If we want to see a large version, version of it, it's a part of a sphere. You just have to cut it out and polish it, make it shiny. Now, here, the outside surface, well, it used to be a large surface, large sphere, and this is just a small part of that. So outside surface reflects the light and, uh, well, you can see your image is distorted. And uh, this is, we call a convex mirror. Another type of a mirror, concave mirror, when the inner surface is shiny, makes an image. And this type of a mirror you can easily find in any store. You can just go to, I don't know, Walgreens, CVS, anywhere, and buy a mirror like this. That's it. This is a concave mirror. And if you look at it, you can see that when you look at yourself and make it closer and closer, your orientation changes. When you look in the mirror far away, the image is inverted. And now the image is upright. But again, you see that image only because an extra lens, an extra optical device is acting. Well, <clears throat> we start from a concave mirror, which looks like this. Of course, it has a middle point, And uh, a line which is perpendicular to that has a name, the principal axis. So we draw a principal axis. Now we can draw several light rays. First one. Well, <coughs> a light ray is not very smart. Well, I would say a light ray is not very bright. It doesn't see a lot of things around. All it sees only this location. So for this light ray, light, light ray this whole mirror is acting like a just standard flat mirror, but angled a little bit. That, why, that is why this light ray getting reflected according to the law of reflection. So it, it is smart enough to carry a protractor. <clears throat> so to, using the protractor, it draws a perpendicular, and then it draws a reflected ray. Well, it reflected itself. And then it travels in that direction. Eventually, it crosses somewhere the principal axis. And uh, all other light rays do exactly the same thing. They travel, they measure, they imagine that this is a flat surface, measure angle, and get reflected according to the law of reflection. And they all travel more or less through the same point as we saw. Well, <coughs> if the curvature 
of this mirror is not very large, which means, well, we can say, let's say this distance is much less than the size of the mirror. These distances have no names, have no special symbols, but we can see yeah, that if we bend, make it more and more curved, this distance increases. Yeah, that's it, like a cross size of the mirror, and this is a long. So if this is much smaller than this, if, if the mirror is almost flat, in that case, all the rays, reflected rays, travel practically through the same point. And because that happens, this point is important, so we give it a name, we call it a focal point. And the distance from a mirror to this point has a name of focal distance. People use capital F or lowercase f. And using the law of reflection or common sense or just memorizing things, turns out the focal distance is equal to a half of the radius of the sphere this mirror is cut out. So if we know the radius of this sphere, a half of that gives the focal distance. And uh, this is an actual location. You saw it. It existed. You can point a finger here. You don't need an extra optical device. You can just place a screen and you look at it. So this focal point, a real, real focal point. But if we use a, con uh, a convex mirror, again, principal axis, and if we look at uh, several rays, they will be reflected away from the principal axis. So when that happens, we don't use actual rays. We use geometrical fixture, an extension. We imagine how would that ray would travel if it could travel backwards. In this situation, as we saw, all rays which are initially parallel to the principal axis and to each other, they cross the same, well, not the rays, extensions of those rays cross at the same point. Well, there is no light behind the mirror. So this point is only in our imagination. We can place a screen here, and we will not see a thing. But we can imagine it, exi it exists. So we call it a focal point, but we call it virtual or imaginary. And this focal distance is said to be negative. So the magnitude of this is still equal, equal a half of the radius of the sphere, but the actual value will be negative one half of that. That's all we need to remember. So <coughs> facts, more facts for a concave mirror, for a convex mirror, same facts on the same slide now. We can see, we compare. Same facts with more examples. And now we have to use those facts to draw images of objects placed in front of a mirror. We did it for a flat mirror. And now we have to do it for a spherical mirror. So case number one. Well, first of all, when we draw a picture in physics, we call it a diagram. And a diagram doesn't have to show all actual properties of all actual objects. So we don't have to see the actual mirror. We need, we need to know where it's located here, and we need to know the type of it. So normally we just draw a straight line with a little curved ends, which describe the curvature of that mirror. This is a 
concave mirror. It must have focal point, which is a half of the radius, so there has to be somewhere a center of that sphere from which we cut out that mirror. These are standard uh, features of a diagram. Now we need to place an object where? Well, these two points naturally divide the whole line in three regions. One, two, three. So we're just going to go from left to right. First, we can place an object Well, to the left of the center. All people call it to the left, to the doubled focal distance. This is one single focal distance. And this is doubled focal distance, which is the radius. And we place our objects here. <clears throat> so we have to repeat the procedure we used for the flat mirror, but we need to know that any ray which is traveling toward a mirror parallel to the principal axis, when reflected, must travel through, how do we call it? Focal point. So this is how it must travel. It must travel through the focal point. This is the property of a concave mirror if I draw another ray which is parallel to the principal axis, it must travel through the same focal point. All of them, when they parallel to the principal axis, should be traveling through the same focal point. The thing is, if they all travel through the same focal point, why do we need them? We just need one, one ray. And now we need a second, which goes away from the same point, but different from this one. And of course, we could choose many, many, many different rays, but the most convenient one is the ray which hits the mirror right in the middle. In that case, this ray, because it obeys the law of reflection, should be reflected at the same angle. Well, at this point, it would be nice to have a ruler because rays cannot bend. They have to be straight. Anyway, that's the rule. We only need two rays. One, two. And those two rays cross somewhere. And this location tells us an image of the top point of an of an object, that's an object. And this is an image of the top of an object. But of course, we could repeat the same procedure for all points of an object. We will get more and more points here. This will give us the whole image, including the location of an image, the size of an image, the orientation of an image. This is an image. So. The size of an image, features of an image. First of all, it's inverted. So this should be negative. However, if I would calculate magnification, which by definition, again, is just this ratio, this is the size of an object, that should be a negative number. But the magnitude of this number should be less than 1 because an image is smaller, reduced. Now, a distance from an object to a mirror, always a positive number, a distance from a mirror to an image. Well, <coughs> there is an agreement for a real image formed by actual light rays the image distance should be positive. And this is exactly a case. This image is being formed by actual light rays reflected off this mirror, like we saw. So 
I can take a piece of paper, place it here, use it as a screen, and I can look at the screen and I will see that image. That's what it means, a real image. I don't need an extra lens. Real, so that's another. In, so inverted, real, and smaller, reduced. Case number one is done. Case number two, faster. Same mirror, same focal distance, same doubled focal distance, and now an image is here. What does it change? It does not change the first ray because every ray parallel to the principal axis gets reflected and travels through the focal point. But it will change the second ray, the ray which goes to the middle of the mirror. This angle now is larger and, uh, well, these two rays cross and this crossing point tells us the location, the size of a new image. And this image is again inverted, but real and larger than the object. Now, these are pictures we can use. And if you look very closely at these pictures, you can see lots of lots of triangles which are <coughs> similar or like triangles. For example, there is this type of triangle. Or well, this kind of a triangle. We assume the mirror is almost flat, and more and more different type of triangles. And uh, triangles which include focal distance triangles, which include image distance triangles, which include object distance. And uh, as an exercise at home, you can prove, you prove that these three variables, the object distance, the image distance, uh, in this situation, object distance, it doesn't matter, image distance, and the focal distance related by this equation. We call it a technically thin mirror equation or just mirror equation. And <coughs> as I said, an official definition of the magnification. Oops is this. So let's say again, let's consider I don't know, case number one. We have an object, ray number one travels like this, ray number two travels like this. That's an image. Again, see? Triangles. Triangle Triangle, triangle, a triangle, a triangle, same angle here, same angle here. Uh, <coughs> so that's what we call the object distance. That's what we call the image distance. This is the height of an object. This is the height of an image. And uh, because the image is inverted, it has to be set to a negative number. This is how we write it down. So the magnification is technically this. However, if we look at these triangles, this 
the size of an object divided by the distance from an object to a mirror is equal to, well, the tangent of this angle, which is also equal to the magnitude of the size of an image over the image distance. So there is a more convenient, more practical expression for magnification. It has to be negative, and it has to be image distance over object distance. Of course, I've got a slide with all those equations, but it's based on geometry, and geometry is what we love. Well, we have one more case left. Again, same concave mirror, same focal distance, but now an object is placed between the focal distance, the focal point, and the mirror. How does it affect the first ray? Doesn't every ray parallel to principal axis must travel through the focal point after being reflected? How does it affect the second? It does. Now the angle is even larger. And now these rays do not converge. They do not intersect, intersect, meet. So what do we do? When this happens, no matter what optical device is being used, we must use extensions. So we extend each reflected ray behind the mirror. There is no light. There is no life behind the mirror. <clears throat> Who would live behind the mirror? except Alice. <clears throat> so, and the rabbit. <clears throat> this is a virtual image. Virtual, it doesn't exist. In order to see it, we have to use an additional optical device, a lens, which would converge those diverging uh, rays. So, but if we look at this, we can see immediately it's upright. Plus, it is larger than the object. Magnification is greater than one, and it's positive. However, because it is virtual, the image distance should be set to a negative value. But since we have triangles, and we know geometry, we still can use the same equation to relate to these three variables, the focal point, and the focal distance is positive. It is the same concave mirror. And the object distance is positive because it is always is. It's an object, a real thing. But the image distance will be negative, will be negative. Done with this. So the uh, image is, and we use just capital letter for each important word, virtual, upright, larger, that's it. For every image, we always can list those three features. And uh, this is the summary. Now we got to draw one last diagram for the convex mirror. And for the convex mirror, the location of an object doesn't make any difference, actually. We need to place it somewhere, of course. And we need to draw two rays, one ray which travels toward the mirror. But now we have to draw the reflected ray accurately. And here, We have to choose one correct option from three possible options yeah. when a ray is being reflected. What options are? Right back, below, or above the original direction. That's the only options. When it's right back, 
when it approaches mirror at 90 degrees to the mirror, when it's bending down toward the principal axis, when the mirror is concave. So in this situation, we cannot use this or that. But now we have a next question. Because if this ray is being, being reflected, well, how specifically? Maybe like this, maybe like this, maybe like this. And now we have the infinite number of choices. Yes. I have no idea what you're talking about. Lenses. I don't know what this word means. Right now we are on the mirrors. Eventually we will talk about lenses. But now we just talk about mirrors. So I don't know that word. <clears throat> will you spell it, please? It's hard. So there's one important feature which is missing in this picture. What is missing in this picture? What would make this picture into a diagram? Please tell me. Yeah, yeah, what is missing? A very important element. No, not yet. What does every mirror have? Focal point, do we see the focal point? No, so it's missing. So we have to search for this. Oh, I found it. Here. For the convex mirror, the focal point should be used, the one which is behind the mirror, the virtual focal point. And all rays reflected of that mirror should be reflected in such a way so their extensions should go through the focal point. So I don't know yet how this ray will be reflected, but I do know the extension of that ray should go through the focal point. And now I can draw the reflected ray. That's the procedure. I can choose a different ray which travels parallel to the principal axis, but first, I have to look at the focal point. Then I have to draw an extension, connect to these dots, and then I can draw an actual reflected ray. That's how it works. But I don't need many rays parallel to the principal axis. I need only one. And the second one, of course, is the same as before, the one which hits the mirror in the middle. Because for this ray, the whole mirror acts like a standard flat mirror. So this angle and this angle, angle of incidence, angle of uh, reflection are the same, but they measured from the principal axis. And what do I do now? Of course now, I have to draw an extension. Will an extension of this ray go through the focal point? No because this is not parallel. The rule only works for rays parallel to the principal axis. Well, this extension just goes straight beyond, like this. And here, two extensions cross. And this is an image. What kind of an image? Imaginary, we imagine in it, or we call it virtual, upright, and we can see it is reduced, or we call smaller. This is the object distance. This is an image distance. And this number has to be negative because it's, it, it's representing something which doesn't really exist. However, an equation which relates these variables has to be, again, proved geometrically, but it is exactly the same equation with one additional important fact. For a virtual image, 
the focal distance has to be also set to a negative number, so we have two negatives here. That's it. Done. The equations are exactly the same for any type of a mirror, for any type of an image. However, we have to keep in mind that some variables, depending on the situation, might be positive, might be negative. What? Well, focal distance. These are all possible situations, and these are all possible values. Object distance always positive, but uh, image distance could be positive, could be negative. The size of an object could be positive, could be negative. Sometimes we look at an image and we know. Sometimes we have to calculate first and then figure out, depending on, well, to answer for the number what's going on. So you should draw a picture, make it a diagram, look at it, and choose your answer to this question. This slide is like many, many, I don't know, 10 years old, maybe longer. I have borrowed it from Professor William Scotchpole. Many years ago, when he hired me, I didn't steal it, I borrowed. He gave it to me. I'm not sure if he knew it. <clears throat> and uh, a standard approach, start a diagram from a principal axis. Like every time when we draw a picture about a car or something, we start drawing a picture from a ground. Now, oops, of course, this is when you really, really need a ruler. Now, a mirror, where is it? Here. Is it large? Well, it should be relatively large. But what type of it? Concave. So, <clears throat> where is the focal point? Well, the radius is equal to 60 centimeters. Focal distance, and that is a, a common mistake, is a half of that, one of a half of 60, 30 centimeters. So 30 centimeters, that's the focal point, that's the focal distance. And I, know, I just use the same letter for both. Focal point, F, focal distance, F, 30 centimeters. Very often, we don't have to use any well, conversion, keep centimeters. And now, uh, placed, so at 15 centimeters. So this is the object distance. Technically, already now, we can just search in the memory for a picture like that, because we had it. We had a slide with all possible situations, three possible situations for a concave mirror, one possible situation for a convex mirror. So case one, case two, case three, case four. What kind of a case is that? Three. But another way, of course, is drawing an actual raise two. First one. And the second one. They diverge, which means we have to use extensions. And if we use extensions, that automatically means the image is virtual, is not real. It is not a real image. A real image can only be formed by actual light rays when they converge with each other. So this is the image distance and, uh, well, now, the answer, we can also write immediately the mirror equation. 1 over 30 should be equal to 1 over 15 plus 1 over this. <coughs> and uh, solve it. 
1 over the i is 1 over 30 minus 1 over 15. The common denominator is 30 so times 2 negative 1 over 30. Are we done? No. We have to flip it. So di over 1 equals 30 over negative 1. And even if our diagram would have been wrong by any reason, if we did the math correctly, we would have to say the image must be virtual because the image distance turns out to be negative. Well, and uh, we can just plug the numbers and calculate the magnification height. Next question. The last question for today. Please draw a diagram and answer the question. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes for that. It is a, the same object and it is located by the same mirror, but just at a different distance. And we know for a concave mirror distance matters because out of three possible cases, two would give us a real image and one would give us a virtual imaginary image. All right, we have six more minutes, so one more minute for you to draw a picture, choose your answer. So we will already know that the focal distance for this mirror is 30 centimeters. So as long as an object is placed beyond that at 30 centimeters and one millimeter, that already m makes that image, what? Real, that's it, that's what we know. So the, the, the rest is actually pretty straightforward. Yeah, again, we have to draw a diagram starting from principal axis mirror Concave, focal distance, 30 centimeters. Doubled focal distance is 60 centimeters and 45 is in between. So here we place an object and now we know it will be real, but it will be behind the doubled distance and should be larger, but inverted. And to do that, all we have to draw two rays, number one. Number two, well, it's not to scale, but this is an image, this is an object. Now we just have to throw in the numbers. The equation is the same. And uh, one over 30 should be equal to one over, now it is 45, plus one over di. And now you have to solve it, di is equal to and the answer is, oh, there's no answer. <sighs> now I have to solve it. <clears throat> 30 times 45 range. Uh, what do I do? Minus over here. Uh, 1 over 30 minus 1 over 45. Fifteen is a common factor. Fifteen, yeah. So that's gonna be 
1 over 2 times 15 minus 1 over 3 times 15 uh, times 3 times 2 over 6 times 15. one over so di is equal to 75 16 15 75 right no what do i do times three times two times three times two flip it Six times eight, ninety. Right? Six times fifteen, sixty and thirty, ninety. Ninety centimeters. That's it. Well, any questions? We have one more minute if you have any questions. If not, we're done for today and tomorrow we will we'll pick up Tomorrow, we will talk about lenses. Yes? It is out of 39. Oh, it is. I thought it's out of 39. You were late again. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. I know. Sorry. Yeah. On the first slide, it says... No, oh, on the second slide. Out of 39. It was five points. No, it says five. Too. Yeah. It's out of 39. Yeah. So that, that one point curve. Maybe that's <laughs> No, I think he added it wrong. Yeah, but it says it's